there was our recording, uh, our recording notice. So, um, yeah, so the work that we do is informed by the Post-Secondary Guide to Student Mental Health, which came out um, in 2013, and, and we're really focused on sharing information and knowledge and setting up opportunities for all of us partners across the, the, the country and beyond to be able to collaborate and um, learn from each other. So we hosted a webinar earlier in the fall term, and this is our second webinar. One of the outcomes of that webinar back in November was to really focus a discussion around policy and, and how do we look at policy for a well -being, through a well-being lens. So that's why we're all here today, uh, to learn more about this topic and uh, to hear from the expertise of, of Johnny Morris and Shaylin about what's been done in the past and uh, where can we go from here nationally. So I also want to um, check and see if my co-chair is on the line. Tayab, are you able to unmute your line by pressing star 7 and say hello to everyone? This is Tayab, and uh, thank you, Ashley. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, uh, thank you for the kind introduction. And as Ashley uh, briefed you, um, our COP is uh, focused on uh, <coughs> uh, the pressing issues uh, facing um, uh, campuses, uh, especially pertaining to mental health. And um, we are very lucky to have uh, Johnny Morris and Shelin today to share their expertise. Um, and uh, those who don't know, the guide that came at Caucus 2013 was um, Johnny Morris and uh, Sue Ting and a couple of other uh, folks uh, uh, played a huge major role in um, steering that uh, ship. Uh, and we hope today is uh, another chapter in forging that uh, <laughs> ship ahead. Thanks, Tayab. And just a note here, um, we've got a comment in the chat box about um, if you can speak up just a little bit when okay. you're speaking. Yeah, or maybe just bring the, uh, the phone, um, phone closer to your mouth there so that everyone can hear. That would be great. Um, and I just wanted to put the uh, agenda slide up for everyone to see right now. So uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the purpose of today's webinar. Um, we're going to go into a brief history and background of some of, the, of some of the work that's been done so far in the area of, of policy and well-being. And then we're going to talk to each other and, and have a brainstorming session. We'll move on to summarize our final thoughts. And then we'll wrap up and talk about ways to stay connected and be involved with our community of practice moving forward. So with that, I am going to pass it off to Johnny and Shaylin to take us through the purpose of today and, and move us forward through the rest of the agenda. And thanks again, Johnny and Shaylin, for being willing to facilitate for us today. Um, thanks so much, uh, Ashley, for the, the very thorough introduction that you've just provided. And thank you, Tayab, um, both of you as co-chairs. Um, continue to steward this work through caucus and, and the partnership with CMHA um, in, a, in a very skillful way. So thank you very much indeed. Um, so just um, for those of you who, who might not know my voice, um, my name is Johnny Morris, and I work here at the um, provincial office of the Canadian Mental Health Association in BC, in Vancouver, um, as the uh, Senior Director of Policy, and um, have the real honor and privilege of, of um, supporting and um, providing guidance to the work of, of Shaylin and Sarah in moving forward Healthy Minds, Healthy Campuses here in BC. And I, having looked at the registration list, it's great to see um, so many folks from, from, from the provincial community here on the line and beyond. Um, so it's really exciting to have, have this conversation um, today. And I think some of you have seen the agenda that um, Ashley just walked through. Um, one of the things that we're really interested in, in moving forward with is supporting a, a national dialogue about um, policy and how policy can really be a, a lever of change when it comes to mental health and substance use amongst post-secondary student populations. And so today is really designed to, um, A, take stock, and, and Shailen has done a, a very thorough job, and she'll actually be walking us through a, a, a wee bit of a, a, um, an up-close history and, and um, sense of what's happening currently with regard to policy in this area and this work that's happening in pockets across Canada um, with regard to um, mental health of post-secondary student populations. And it's also an opportunity, and I'll be stepping into this piece later on the webinar to support some, some uh, cross-dialogue on this group. And so I'll be calling upon people that I 
think might be well positioned to provide some initial commentary and we have some questions prepared. But we really want to support some dialogue during this call from across the country uh, around policy and that will be my role um, later on in the call. And then um, toward the end of, of today we'll be hearing back from Ashley um, and, and Tayab about some next steps. This really, um, as Ashley alluded to, came out of our full webinar um, which really um, has the purpose of what would it look like to set up an incubator? What would it look like to set up um, a really focused uh, group of people working within the concept of a community of practice um, to move forward policy and practice shift in the area of policy um, and, and post-secondary mental health? So that's what we will be doing um, during the course of today. So without further ado, I'm going to turn um, things over to Shay Lin. She's going to introduce herself and uh, walk through um, some of the um, history related to policy for about uh, 20 to 20 to 30 minutes or so. Um, sure. If I can do it quicker, I will. Um, looking forward to getting an update from everybody who's on the line um, in terms of work that's been underway at, at your local campuses and, and pieces that you're really interested in and excited about um, as we move the agenda forward. So um, just going to take a couple of moments to look at some of the milestones and, and some highlights that um, kind of capture a little bit of the collective thinking that's been going on um, roughly since about, um, I'm going to start in, in 2012 um, as kind of a, a bit of a starting place to just kind of look at the last couple of years that have kind of brought um, us here to today in terms of where we're at um, with some of the conversations. So um, providing this, this bit of a lens through um, my chance of working with the initiative um, and actually hadn't really thought about it, but it coincides with the timing that I started with with Healthy Minds, Healthy Campuses for the, the bit of history that I'll provide. And so um, my role here uh, in BC has been as provincial coordinator for our um, community of practice initiative called Healthy Minds, Healthy Campuses. And just a, a brief note that um, the couple of examples that I'm going to, to highlight are some of those ones that are kind of have um, been collaborations or um, are examples of provincial or, or national work in this area and really want to acknowledge that at the same time as some of the couple examples I'm going to go through have been going on, there's been work happening at individual campuses as well. And so when we hit the, the dialogue section, then really looking forward to an opportunity to hear um, from representatives from campuses who have been um, working with this idea of uh, what, what's kind of been come to be known as a, a policy well-being lens. So I'm going to provide a, a bit of a sense of how we, we got there and uh, welcome uh, the further dialogue as I wrap up um, just a couple of examples. So starting in, in 2012, then um, leading into the Healthy Minds, Healthy Campuses Summit that fall, and there had been a, a real um, emphasis on a whole campus approach. And so one of the things that we did then at that summit was create an opportunity to look at some of the different areas. So looking at um, the culture, organizational culture on campuses, looking at support services and some of the things that have later shown up in, in the guide as far as the different components and areas to look at. And so one of those areas was around policies. And so um, folks who were, who were at the summit, which included um, a couple of folks from uh, provinces across Canada as well as our, our core folks here in BC, and they had an opportunity through a World Cafe session to look at um, what, what are the features and characteristics of policies that are really conducive and supportive to um, flourishing on campus. And so they um, had an opportunity to really brainstorm their, those, looking at some of the facilitators for what would bring about those features and characteristics, identifying some potential barriers, and then had a chance to kind of brainstorm what would be some of the methods to direct positive change and who might some of the audience be in terms of involving in the conversation to move some of this work forward. And so that was one of the, the oppor first opportunities that we had to really kind of delve deep into the area of, of policy and, and how that can be a lever, as Johnny mentioned, and recognizing really that um, the policies on our campuses have a connection to both um, I guess the, the way that things happen, but also um, have an opportunity to really foster the things that we want to be seeing on our campuses. So looking at that opportunity of what's sort of hindering um, the current culture and current processes and experiences on our campuses, but what ways we can also use them to be um, positive facilitators. At a similar time, um, we're working um, closely with uh, 
Healthy Minds, Healthy Campuses was with Simon Fraser University to design um, the animated video that has been really helpful um, at campuses really across um, Canada and used internationally to help to kind of really start some of the conversation. And so you see the, the T there that um, in the title slide that was designed around policy and um, on the, the right hand side one of the, the images captured from the animated video that really looks at how these different pieces interplay and the fact that they're interconnected and, and so policies being really one of those, those key pieces that relates to, um, to this work of, of designing healthy campus communities. Sliding forward in, in 2013, as was mentioned by Tayeb and Ashley, was the official release of the National Guide. Policies there was highlighted as that, that top level band, and again, we're seeing the, the movement and the recognition um, across Canada that, that this is an area that has significant potential for action and, and, a, and a significant potential for a call to action around this potential work. And um, within that guide, for anybody who's not familiar, then um, it, it really goes through kind of a bit of a positioning around what, um, what we mean by taking a look at this particular level and some examples and key considerations for campuses to, to take a look at. Moving um, into the the next year, then we had an opportunity to, to play a little um, and, uh, and using an, kind of a technique called a design lab and borrowing from some um, creative um, processes, then one of the areas that we focused on was policy. And so um, for those of you who have joined the, the online group and, and will have the opportunity to learn more about how to get connected to that at the end of the webinar. Um, the image that you would have seen and, and have seen around, um, and may have been wondering, where did this funny image come from that's being used to highlight a well-being lens? And so um, this is actually the, the point in time where it came from. And folks were really invited to explore what the issue was of policy and brainstorm opportunities and essentially um, using the um, creative process language to prototype um, a potential way forward and a potential solution or something that they saw as might be helpful within the landscape of post-secondaries to start to really take action on, on this issue. And so um, the concept of a well-being lens is what came out of that. And, and just to give a, a brief sense of where that came from, then folks were talking about all of the variety of things um, that happen on our campuses or that um, are set out um, within either official policy or maybe small p policy on our campuses or provincially connected to our governments and our communities that really impact um, student mental health and well-being. And so taking a little bit of look at some of the, the factors that relate to this work um, and factors that both foster and hinder and, and it was a, a key point in time when the conversation around the social determinants of health really emerged. And so um, in that left hand quadrant and it was looking at, you know, what impacts well being. And so there was a conversation about that and um, you see a dollar sign there. So thinking about sort of access to, to economic resources and tuition and some of those things that, that really came in there. And in the conversation was what would it look like to help to support um, a review of both existing policies and new policies. And that was where the language um, as far as kind of um, this bit of a, a history comes in of where we really zeroed in on the concept of a well-being lens and creating something that would be useful in that policy process um, to bring to light potential changes that would be important. Just as a, a side note, some of the conversations and, and where the, the concept had sort of emerged from was through the, the notion of impact assessments. So some of you may be familiar, um, I think one of the, the longest standing ones in community government have been around um, environmental impact assessments. Um, but for the last number of years, there's also been a big emphasis on health impact assessments. And so that's been a, a big portion at a government level um, if we parallel that to sort of our, our governing structures at a post-secondary institution, whereby they were recognizing that there are things that, that impact and influence health that sit outside the health sector or our ministries of health. And so if there was a process and a, a way that we might be able to work across 
ministries to look at what um, decisions in other departments and areas um, that maybe didn't have health at top of mind might be able to use to, to critically analyze their processes to take a look at, at ways that um, either things that perhaps were having um, some unintended consequences or maybe ways that they could have some really positive consequences if they tweaked them a certain way. And so um, I've just included a couple of examples on this slide and we can, we can share some more that, that folks are aware of um, following this webinar. But the first one is around um, a health equity impact assessment that's been designed and implemented through the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care in Ontario. And the second one is around a mental well-being impact assessment toolkit out of England. So just to give you a quick sense, if, if um, you've never seen an, some of these impact assessments before, um, this is a, a quick look at the template for the health equity one. And um, it kind of has some of the key pieces that you want to be looking at down the side and then really invites folks to think about what are the potential impacts, how might you mitigate that, what would some monitoring and, and different things look like. And so um, by way of noting, um, one of the things that came up in the conversation and, and where we landed on lens instead of impact assessment, and folks on the line can, during dialogue um, session can maybe touch on this in terms of their, their experience on trying to do some of this work on their campuses, but um, there was a strong recognition that a full impact assessment takes a lot of time. <laughs> and so um, it, was, it was really trying to be mindful as we move forward this work on campuses, what it might, um, what we might be able to design that would be um, useful and practical and not cumbersome. So um, putting a, a strong recognition out there that um, some of the uh, more elaborate impact assessments um, are quite um, time consuming and uh, and, and do have some really fantastic um, discussion and, and uh, mitigation strategies that come out of them, but really being mindful as we move forward this work on campuses, what would really fit and work within our particular context and, and the particular unique context across colleges, institutes, and universities um, across Canada. By way of just a, a quick note, um, the Mental Wellbeing Impact Assessment Toolkit um, is is quite elaborate, and uh, the um, link to that um, is available through the resource section in the online community platform. Um, but it's uh, it's a document that kind of walks through a bunch of things, and just on the left hand side captured a bit of their flow chart around the process of really looking at um, screening, looking at scoping, appraising the process, identifying potential positives or negative impacts, and then indicators and, and reporting and, and moving the work forward. And um, one of the key pieces that's really um, powerful and, and strong within this particular toolkit is the way that they've outlined the various types of factors and determinants. And so on the right-hand side, which you, you can't fully um, read in detail, but um, the various different color blocks in that circle wheel um, start to look at from, from the inside, looking at what are the immediate things that impact um, mental health and well-being, um, and what are the, some of the protective factors, what are some of the population characteristics, and then in that green sphere, starting to look at the wider determinants, so getting, again, uh, a bit of a look at the social and physical determinants of health within our communities, and, um, and looking a little bit at some of the social justice and equity issues that we know are really strong um, impacts on mental health and substance use and overall flourishing and well-being of, of populations. So that particular toolkit is a, um, a detailed one, but a great source for ideas. And, and their, um, a bunch of their templates, as you take a look through, does walk through a similar sort of idea of how do we uh, kind of assess these various different components. So um, that kind of captures a, a bit of the conversation that led us to, to the lens component. Looking specifically at documenting some of this process, then um, OCAD and Ryerson University um, had the opportunity to really pull together um, a, a key report that was released in April of 2014 that was looking at a scan of current practices within um, the realm of policy approaches to post-secondary student mental health. And so um, for anyone who hasn't seen this yet, the, the image on the right kind of um, started to break out uh, in looking specifically at a campus context, 
what some of those social determinants might be, what some of the related policies might be related to those. Um, so looking at, at the broader issue and then, and then narrowing down to um, ones that are really proximal and close to students who are experiencing distress. And so um, through that document, they outlined some of the different ways that people were starting to look at policy. And the concept of universal um, on a spectrum to individual was one of the key concepts there. Building on that report and having an opportunity to create some dialogue nationally, there was a session that was organized at the caucus conference in 2014 um, following the release of this report and had an opportunity to really engage folks from across Canada who are working and thinking and, and really interested in this area. And um, I've captured here on the right one of the, the other key images from that document that, and then one of the, the key conversations that took place which um, shows again that universal to individual, but also this notion of consolidated versus mainstreamed. And so the mainstreamed end of the spectrum is really where we get at of this kind of something that, that aligns and matches up with this policy well-being lens. And so um, that notion really fits with the concept of mainstreaming and the fact that we're, we're looking at embedding a lens around mental health and well-being within all policies and across policies that exist compared to um, the notion of creating a mental health and well-being policy on campus. And so the report um, really takes an opportunity to, to highlight some different areas where folks um, have done either one or the other of these types of approaches or a combination and starts to look at what, how that plays out on a, on a campus. But um, the, the mainstreamed one starts to look at the, the concept of it would be um, if we, we take the research and evidence and theory that points to the different ways and different levers that we have on our campuses to really make a difference, um, then it would be really tough to pull all of those policies into one. And, um, and to have folks kind of um, apply and, and address their policies through, through one specific um, policy that was relating to mental health. And so um, the concept of ways that we can start to mainstream it really started to resonate. Um, and through uh, that particular uh, concurrent session at Caucus 2014, there was a small national group that was formed. Um, and, uh, and so Su Ting was a, was a key leader in, in orchestrating that. And um, we had some Google Hangouts and some different things that, that were starting to happen um, following that discussion uh, that uh, kind of continued some of the, the thinking and, and work um, that's been happening on various campuses. And, and again, contributing to some of that collective thinking um, that's, that's helped move along the conversation. Later on, um, last year, then the Ontario Centre for Innovation in Campus Mental Health had the opportunity to organize a, a webinar that, um, again, was taking an opportunity through an online format to, to share out some of the concepts that were in that particular report around a policy approaches and to engage a couple of folks, um, both Su Ting from Ryerson and then um, Tara and Cheryl from BC, from SFU and UBC. and um, and from Confederation College to share some of their experiences. And so this was a webinar that uh, is available in an archived form on their website um, that had an opportunity to really sort of touch on and, and again, contribute to some of that, that further dialogue. The last bit in uh, the kind of uh, background and a bit of a, a history journey that we're going to take um, today on this webinar is just to highlight um, the most recent thing in, in the history that relates um, really strongly to this particular topic area, and that's the release of the um, new International Charter. And so um, for those of you who aren't familiar, at the International Conference um, for Health Promoting Universities and Colleges that took place in June in Kelowna, BC um, of last year, 2015, um, there was one of the key outcomes of that conference was a new international charter. And so representatives from 45 different countries that had the opportunity to engage in pre-work and, and work at the conference to really um, envision and work through and, um, 
and really uh, insightfully take a look forward into the future and consider, you know, what do we need as far as, as a charter to really guide this work and to really mobilize further action in this area. And so um, under the first call to action, which came out, which was to embed health into all aspects of campus culture across the administration, operations, and academic mandates. That was the first call to action. And the, the first kind of sub-action within that area Specifically, as you can see on the screen, um, as a capture from that particular charter document, was to embed health in all campus policies. So that kind of gives a, a bit of a summary of where things are at at this point, and uh, really looking forward to hearing from folks who are exploring and doing this work on their campuses and have been for the last number of years and, and many of you actually on the line before 2012 um, had started to take uh, a look at this work and um, were, were key um, folks involved in, in capturing this um, capturing this vision and, and moving this work forward that, that we've had the opportunity to help to support and, and walk alongside the campuses um, through this process. So um, thank you very much indeed, Shailen, for, for um, 20 minutes of very rich um, descriptions of, of what we've been up to in Healthy Minds Healthy Campuses, both within our own community in partnership with all of the institutions we reach here in BC, but of course much more broadly than that in partnership with POCUS and, and institutions across Canada. And so what we're going to turn to now, and this is really to put all of you on notice, um, all of the, the folks that we have, I think we have 60 people online this morning, is, is we're going to turn toward a very interactive part of the webinar. And so um, one of the um, underpinning principles of these webinars is to really support learning. And so we're, what we're about to do is really create um, a learning environment where people can, can respond to the material that Shailen has already shared. Um, start to pose questions, start to think, think out loud together to really generate some momentum at a national level around policy um, in campus. And so um, just to kind of activate that dialogue, just some of my um, high-level pieces here, just to kind of draw out from what Shailen had said in, in such a rich way, was um, the question of determinants. And often, you know, in, in the world of policy, which is the world I sit in now quite a lot of the time, you know, determinants can feel like very abstract and out there kinds of things. And, and I think Shailen really brought forward um, the importance of using tools or lenses or thinking through determinants, which of course have a huge impact upon student well-being and more broadly community well-being in a campus when it comes to thinking about policy. So thinking about determinants, whether it's housing, knowing that there's some, some student groups on the line today who, who are very interested in, in the determinant, for example, of financial burden upon student mental health or uh, food security, and so students' ability to access food. Um, if a student can only eat craft dinner for three months, their mental health is going to be severely impaired right through to housing, et cetera. And so that's just one thing I want to throw out there as, as something for us to think through. And of course, um, policy as it affects campuses in more rural and rural loca locations. Um, the idea of health in all policies, so um, we have policies like threat management or threat risk assessment policies or policies focused upon supporting students to involuntary or voluntarily withdraw from their studies if they have a mental illness. Um, so those would probably stand as, as standalone policies versus um, looking at the creation of policy um, where health is incorporated throughout and mainstreamed as, as Shailen was describing earlier. So what does, um, what does healthful, uh, to quote a student, uh, Justin, who is very involved in our community, what does healthful academic policy look like? What does health in campus planning look like? Um, and the last little kind of tidbits just as we open this up is, of course, policy is a way of framing how we understand people with mental illness and substance use. And so words are productive. Words make worlds. So the policies that we write really do um, set forth how we as institutions um, understand people living with uh, mental health and substance use problems. It, it, it defines how we characterize, um, how we um, frame support, how we um, want to eradicate stigma. It really does um, frame the, the latest thinking in, in how we conceptualize. So do policies frame students with mental illness as risks? Or do policies frame students living with mental illness as, as, as actors um, and citizens within the campus context um, who are influenced by many of the determinants that we've talked about? 
And finally, um, the one piece I just want to throw out there, there is, as a catalyst is, is how do we involve students in policy co-design? Many of you as, as institutions have students in your decision-making bodies. And so one thing I want to just encourage people to think about to animate the dialogue is, is where, do we, where do we involve and how do we involve um, students in, in policy co-design when it comes to the work that Shailen has described in the pieces that I'm just pushing a little around accelerating our dialogue. So I'm now going to, um, we have a, a good chunk of time together this morning. We probably have a good 45 minutes of dialogue before I turn things back to, to Ashley and Tia to close. And so the question that's on the table um, really is um, what has action in the area of policy looked like on your campus to date? And you might, this might create a little bit of nervousness among some of you as I tend to pick on people I know to get the conversation going. And I don't have to do that because one of you might leap in in the next few moments and, and, and start the conversation. But um, we really want to hear now from wherever you are across the country, what does action in the area of policy um, look like in, in your campus community? So I'll just take a pause to see if anyone wants to leap in before I might recruit um, recruit um, people to, to kind of get going. And as a reminder, you might start talking to yourself and we won't hear you. Star seven is what you need to press um, to unmute your law. So hearing, hearing um, that no one's wanting to leap forward, which is totally okay, I'm going to maybe turn to a colleague, Simon Fraser University. Um, Rosie Dalawal to see if, if you might be able to weigh in for a few seconds on what's happening at SFU in this area of policy, mental health, substance use. Rosie, are you with us? Yes. Good, good afternoon or good morning, depending on where everyone is. Um, thanks for arranging this uh, webinar. It's really fantastic. And so at SFU, we, we started with uh, basically stakeholder consultation. We did a series of focus groups both with students and staff and faculty and then also consulted with some key informants. And then we had our student volunteers, our student health Adv advisory committee also uh, get feedback on the impact of policy on well-being. And in addition, uh, we were doing some consultation around our vision for a healthy campus community. Uh, I guess that was in 2013. And so we did ask specific questions about policy in that regard as well. And so we had consulted over 200 campus members in terms of their thoughts on the impact of policy and perhaps what could be done to improve uh, policy. And similar to what's been discussed, not necessarily a policy on uh, mental well-being or well-being, but to embed uh, policy, uh, well-being in all aspects of uh, policies, whether they're big P or little P. And so we also had a student uh, work with us, a couple of students actually, who reviewed policies in terms of uh, the language, the understandability, the associated procedures that are outlined. And those two students were the ones who conducted the focus groups to ask uh, further questions. And so our student prepared uh, more of a summary report in terms of all of this uh, data that we had. And from there, uh, we've, we have a draft guide for um, well-being through SFU policy. And it's still draft, so unfortunately, I can't share it out just yet, but um, it's going through some channels here um, at SFU in terms of uh, Senate and such. We've, we worked with the Associate Registrar uh, to develop this guide and so that helped us tremendously in terms of uh, gaining some leverage of course and um, to have uh, a key partner in, in the project. And so uh, some of the, let me share just uh, some of the concepts that are in this guide are um, that the policies will embed a culture of respect, fairness and support uh, for student success and well-being, and that navigating policy is um, seen as a learning experience and extension of students' formal education. And so what we've done is ha uh, developed a few guidelines that are still draft but that fall under policy development and review, content writing and format, 
um, application and interpretation. And some of, uh, one of the things I can share is we've advocated for use of plain language as much as possible and also a clear rationale. So in reviewing all the policies, and, and uh, these were policies in the academic calendar, so I think about 112 policies actually. And I, I reviewed them myself in terms of uh, working on this project. We found that some had a clear rationale and some didn't. In some, the language used was quite um, strong in terms of, of course, a legal language, but also not necessarily creating a culture of support or respect um, um, at, at SFU. And so, so that's one of the key pieces we, we've advocated for. And just another short example I can give is um, we had feedback from our trans community on campus that when reading policies and for the policy to refer to the student as he or she, that that's not, of course, the most inclusive because students may not identify. Um, and so one of the things we're working with our associate registrar to do is, is to sub out all of the notes, uh, notation of he or she when referring to the student and to say the student or students or they to be, to be more inclusive. So that's a brief, brief little summary. And that's great, Rosie. And I think um, so much in what you're saying, I, I think primarily, I think many of us will be eagerly awaiting um, the release of your draft, which I think probably will document both the process you described so, so clearly of um, you know, engaging with a, a broad group of people, including a, a very significant group of students at your campus. Um, and these principles-based statements that you've already started to describe, so just even you describing the tension between the legalese that often frames policy, academic policy, and, and those kinds of, of things with language that might uh, enable conditions for respect and dignity and compassion, um, which, which is quite interesting, just thinking about the words that we actually use. I'm wondering, just, just to kind of layer on top of um, the, um, the comments that Rosie's made, does, does anyone on the line who just listened to Rosie's story have um, a question or a response that they'd like to make, just so we can layer the dialogue a little? Sure. Can I add just one thing, um, Johnny, while people are pondering? I have a quote sure. from our focus group participants who said, it's uh, it's not just anybody can get a degree at SFU. So there's the integrity of the policies that we need to uphold. But we need to frame it in a way that it's not a punitive policy. That's why we're upholding the integrity, isn't it? So I thought that was a very interesting point. Yeah, a very, and a, a very powerful point, very poignant. Thank you, Rosie, for, for adding that piece. Any, any, um, any responses or, or thoughts from, from people in response to Rosie. And, and, and just while people are still pondering, you can see in the chat other people are sharing resources. Um, Ashley has just shared the UBC framework for Senate consideration of student mental health and well-being, which is a, a significant contribution to, to this, this work as well. But anyone want to chime in? Hey, Johnny, this is Ashley. I actually have a question. Yeah, I have a question for Rosie. Um, this is something that we're kind of, we just at the University of Calgary, we just finished launching our campus mental health strategy in December. So it's still very new and we're embarking on our implementation plan um, in the coming, coming weeks and months and policy was recognized in that strategy. And so Rosie, I heard you say that there was 112 policies that you, that you went through. Um, and so just, I guess two questions. Number one, did that include policies, procedures, guidelines, like the whole package of all the institutional documents? And then was there also a review of things like the strategic goals of the institution, um, the academic plan, some of those not necessarily policy documents, but really the, the documents that shape the culture and the goals of the institution? So that's kind of my first question. And then my second question is about, did you mainly focus on already existing policies and, and procedures and, and use your guidelines to, to make some recommendations on how those could be changed? 
or have you implemented a process that any future new developing policy will follow those guidelines and that those guidelines will also stand for um, policies on a scheduled review cycle? So just kind of some specific questions about the mechanisms that you've used. Yeah, thanks Ashley, thanks for your question. So to clarify, we only reviewed policies in the academic calendar and that was, we're working in partnership with our associate registrar and these are the policies that fall under her role. And so the types of um, examples I can give is, um, you know, readmission, undergraduate admission, grading, reconsideration of grades, um, protection of privacy, programs, course change and withdrawal policies, medical requirements, student appeals, and such. And so we reviewed those uh, with the procedures that are pertinent to those policies. But that's only a small subset, of course, in terms of all of the policies um, here at SFU in uh, a broader context. And then to your second question, um, the guide we've developed is still draft, of course, but what we're hoping is that future policies that are developed will take this guide into consideration so that when policies are created or renewed, that they'll take these, um, these recommendations uh, into consideration. And it, that, that, of course, comes with some uncertainty. So we have to see if we can get um, senior level support, as many of you can appreciate, in terms of it being a recommended tool to use rather than a mandated tool, because I, I can foresee that it could come with some, some pushback in terms of it being mandated. Does that answer your second question, Ashley? Yeah, that answers both questions. I, um, I really appreciate that. I can, I can imagine it's, um, it's a big process and, and just I think the, the comment at the end there about getting the support from administration and, and different ways and, and mechanisms that we can, if things aren't mandatory, that we can um, approach, approach this. And I know um, Jenna was actually the one who shared what UBC is doing with their Senate, so it will be interesting to hear how they've managed to do that as well. Um, but yeah, that answers my question, and I see a couple more coming in from the, at the chat as well. I wonder sure. if we should... Um, can if I we just should add a, yeah. a piece as well? Um, we're hoping to connect with partners across campus. So for example, um, one of our faculty members in health sciences is advocating for revising the tobacco policy on campus or moving towards perhaps a smoke-free campus. And so we're looking for examples where people may adopt uh, the recommendations that we're saying and so that we can have a tangible example of, you know, we've, we've um, collaborated with this group uh, in, in order to increase the awareness and, of course, hopefully motivation for others to consider using the guide. So that's uh, still in process. Thank you, Rosie. And, and um, I just, yeah, I did, I did, I think a couple of pieces have come in from folks, but I'm also keen just to, to hold space around Rosie's story at Simon Fraser and also knowing that we have quite a national contingent on the call. Um, just hold a few moments and we'll make sure we go back to the couple of questions that have come forward for, for Rosie. But um, are there other folks from across um, the country um, outside of BC who may also want to weigh in on, on what they're currently doing in the area of policy? on their campus, just to support some inter-institutional dialogue too. So I'm looking specifically at outside of British Columbia currently. I also know the Mental Health Commission is on the call this morning and I'd be curious from that vantage point at a federal policy level if anything um, that they might be hearing might um, also be of interest around um, policy work, knowing that in November there was a very important uh, consensus conference focused on um, young adults and mental health, and I'm sure campus was a key part of that. Just to kind of throw that question out there too. Hello? Hello. Can you hear Hi me? there. Hi, Johnny. It's Lara. Hi, Lara. I, I, I thought I... Uh, I would um, prompt you to, to weigh in here. Go ahead, Lara. Yeah. Lara, yeah, where so, are you from? So I'm calling in from the Mental Health Commission in Ottawa, and um, I'm, a re I'm a recent addition to the commission. I started at the end of November, so I came in right after the conference 
was held, and unfortunately my colleague who organized that conference could not be on the line. But um, yes, there was a lot of talk about campus mental health at that conference, and, um, and not just PSE, but um, kind of a life course perspective on the importance of integrating concepts of wellness starting in early childhood all the way through primary, secondary, and post-secondary, and what that might look like. Um, and so a focus on prevention, as well as a focus on literacy and awareness, and, um, and also access. So to services and, uh, and programs. So that's kind of what we heard, and we're still in the process of um, reaching a consensus with our emerging adults and the jury. And so we're excited to kind of produce something that may be of interest to people on the call, and um, it's really r wonderful to hear about all the great work that's going on. Great. And I think, Laura, there's a real clearinghouse co collection piece from that Mental Health Commission piece, given that work you did back in November. So. Um, thanks, Lara, for, for weighing in. I know um, Donna um, Karulak has, has raised her hand as well. Donna, do you want to weigh in at this point? And just to remind you, star seven to unmute your line. Donna, are you there? Uh, my Hi, Donna. Go ahead. Maybe start speaking. We'll see if we can pick you up. Is this working out okay? I can hear you loud and clear, Donna. Go ahead. So, yeah, not so much a question right now, but I may have more down the road. But I just want to chime in that uh, Vancouver Island University at all of our campuses, as um, we've got students, uh, faculty, staff, and community members uh, creating a it's, it, it sounds like a lot of people, but we've got about a dozen people on a well-being steering com framework committee. And uh, so we are doing a lot of those pieces that have been done in the earlier chats. And uh, we partnered with the uh, First Nations Health Authority and looked at the model. So we're really working on process in our group as well. You know, the process of language that I heard you speak about, getting stakeholders from students, community members, administrators. And our next step, each of our steering committees is, is now partnering with another member of the institution, and uh, we're having those talks with senior management and administrators and student union, and each, each connection we make and understanding of what well-being is, we're going to keep broadening those conversations in focus groups, and hopefully everyone at the institution will be involved in that conversation and communication at some point. So we're starting with a policy framework, uh, um, taking our voices about what that means to us and wanting to really, really listen to people, what that means to them, and uh, create formal policy from that. So a lot of the work that you've done, but one of the things is we've partnered a lot with community members and the First Nation Health, Health Authority in adopting a lot of the First Nation health and wellness practices in our, in our uh, policy as well. Mm -hmm. and, it's, and it's so great, Donna, to hear from, from your perspective as a Mid-Island University, mm -hmm. um, you know, your really robust consideration of process and, and enlisting a health authority as a partner, which is something that... Um, is important to think about when bridging services between campus and community. And so to hear you um, in partnership with the First Nations Health Authority, which of course is a provincial health authority here in BC, and, and paying such particular attention to process, language, inclusion, um, also are such rich and important ingredients of policy design. So, so thank you, Donna, for that example. Yeah, it's um, a really uh, exciting project to be working on. That's, that's fantastic. And before, um, what we're going to do now is just to give folks of what's coming up on the horizon, we're going to turn to our next question in a few moments, but I, I wanted A, to give an opportunity to any campuses to weigh in on this question that's on your screen, and then we'll just do a quick, a quick look at what's in the chat box to make sure we don't miss anything. But does anyone else want to weigh in in a similar way to Donna or respond to Rosie? And I, I'm open Hi. to BC. Hello. Oh, go ahead. Hello. Hi. Uh, my name is Jenna Matthew. I'm from the Student Society, the Alma Mater Society at UBC Vancouver. Great. And Welcome. It's great to have a student voice. Go ahead. And so um, I wanted to speak about kind of a little bit further down the line. So UBC is at this place 
um, where, and Ashley, thank you for posting the uh, framework for Senate consideration. Um, Senate recently considered and approved um, a framework um, surrounding student mental health and well-being, even actually setting up a um, ad hoc committee of Senate to deal with student mental health and well-being, of which there's always been a student chair, so I'm currently um, the chair of that committee. And the place we're at is a very interesting one, um, where we're actually going ahead and editing and fixing academic policies at this point, but now we're in a place of, okay, and what next? How do we make sure that policies don't change and practices stay, stay the same? How do we ensure that um, the academic core of the institution actually um, puts into place the mental health considerations for students, but also for themselves that, um, that we are changing now in policy? And, and what does this mean going forward in the larger conversation surrounding well-being? So this year, um, the VP students, as well as quite a few others, have, have kind of led the charge on um, trying to have a larger conversation surrounding well-being at the institution, making mental health one of the five pillars, but realizing that there's many others and trying to ensure that mental health um, is a part of the larger conversation surrounding well-being. Um, but it's an interesting place that we're at because um, a few years ago when students um, who were the ones who brought forward the Senate framework for consideration on student mental health and well-being um, thought about policy, I think there wasn't necessarily um, a thought about, okay, and what next once we fix those policies. And that's where we're at. And so um, we really are working hard to try and figure out what the next steps are to ensure that practice actually um, is adopted um, after policies are changed. Well, and Jenna, and I, am I saying your, am I, did I hear your name correctly, Jenna? Yeah, so it's so great to hear um, you describe um, arguably um, a good segue into the next question, a challenge. So trying to navigate the, the, the gap between policy shift and practice shift and um, how to mitigate that. So I, I think actually that's a lovely question to bring forward into the next part of our dialogue around some of the, some of the successes and challenges that, that folks have been having. And, and great to hear um, so much progress has been made at UBC, um, especially around your pillars work and ensuring mental health is in there. So I, I want to just hold on to that to move forward into the next part of the conversation. And just I want to just highlight, because not everyone has access to the chat function, and so I just want to highlight some of the chats that have come through. And Rosie, just to put your notice, you might want to send a chat through because uh, it will get posted or targeted because there's a few questions for, for you. But Shailene, could you just scroll up and see? Um, so here, um, one person from UNBC, the Assistant Director for Student Affairs, had a question for Rosie specifically about that statement that you read um, out around only certain students can attend SFU and, and the implications of that statement for those living with a diagnosed mental illness. So you might want to shoot back the text um, of the statement that you read, and which I think had lots of themes related to, to equity um, at Simon Fraser. Uh, Katie Shaw, who's also with us, um, has a question about um, if there's any public information on the guiding principles of wellness that were used by SFU to begin the discussions with your stakeholders. So those are two questions for you, Rosie, that have, have come through. Um, and then moving on um, um, has already been responded to, and I'm just looking to see if there's anything else here. Um, and we, we heard from someone at UNB St. John, Tanya Pitt, um, and um, they have a report called the Healthy Campus Community Project. Um, but that report, which that, that position was actually um, meant to be a starting place for policy to, to be built upon. And Sarah Abelson has also um, chimed in with regard to Active Minds. Uh, which is a state-based organization with chapters in Canada uh, that are actually looking to train student leaders in policy advocacy. And, um, and there's a link that maybe Ashley or someone else can make available, Sarah can make available to the rest of the group, and it may already have happened. Um, and, and one final comment I'll read out at this point was there was a conference in Ottawa at the end of January called Connexus 16, attended by Kathy Saunders, who's also in the line with us today. And there was a great session there focused on mental well-being and career life planning, flourishing for life, and Mount Royal University 
um, was, was featured there. And there's a question here about mental health and career. So transitioning, transitioning to college and university is often where we think, but transitioning to career, and I know the University of Alberta has done uh, lots of that work. And Rosie's already started responding. So that's super. So we'll now move on to the next bubble screen. And this is um, a focused um, dialogue on successes and challenges. And this is a real opportunity for people on the call to say, hey, we haven't even considered policy. I, uh, we, we don't, we, we're not even at that point. We're, we're actually just grappling with services. Some of you may have had challenges with policy work or successes. Um, and maybe what I'll do is tie back to Jenna's question. Do any of you have ideas about how to mitigate the gap between policy shift at a big level like Senate and actually practice shift at, at the level of, of faculty interacting with students, for example. Any ideas or other challenges or successes? And I might just, um, while people are pondering, refra reframe Jenna's piece. Academic policy being passed at the Senate can feel quite removed from the individual special instructor teaching a course who's expected to facilitate or embody those policies. Um, how might we catch um, the, the people who are at the end of policy and its implementation um, into the, the vast sweeping changes that have been part of the call today. Are there any ideas about that? So this is Shailen here again, and I, I just um, was reminded and, and kind of struck by um, the the loop back to the design lab work that, that happened when, when some of this conversation was taking place. And um, the for anybody who can remember the slide that was up when I was showing the one that had sort of the well-being lens, there was kind of this, um, this little um, prototype on top of it that looked sort of like a house. And um, so one of the, the groups um, that were exploring the particular topic of policy had sort of broken off and, and um, took up this topic of policies and procedures and were identifying the fact that um, there's a lot of things to consider outside of exactly what, what's written in a policy. And so um, the couple of, um, I'll use the word pillars again, although different than um, the particular pillars that uh, that UBC has been working on in their well-being strategy, but um, these particular pillars were ones that they were looking at in terms of how to really enact change in policy. And so some of them were around transparency, some of them were around um, making sure that the procedures and guidelines um, were really um, thoughtfully either redeveloped and communicated, or um, a key theme also that came out was around engaging folks in the process um, who are the ones who are who are actually on the ground. So uh, if there's a way to really be thoughtful about doing that. And and just the, the conversation of, um, I think, that, that inter interaction between the culture on campus and so the, the way we do things around here, um, the autopilot as um, Dan Reist and, and some folks who have um, been looking really closely at, at culture and, and organizational culture um, have chatted about. Um, and this, this neat sort of systems interaction between policy and culture. And so the concept that um, policy can sort of be a lever for change in culture, um, but that it really needs to be attended to. Because on the other part of that loop, culture is really influencing the way that we interpret um, and implement policy or or perhaps maybe don't even implement it the way it's written. And so um, so I think I would just second based on the conversations that I've been a part of of, of really um, echoing this concept. Uh, we've got this one sort of challenge or opportunity of thinking about what tools we might use to um, create literacy amongst policymakers and reviewers to be thinking about mental health and well-being um, within their, their policies. Um, so we've got 
that sort of challenge around what does that look like and some of the questions that have come in have talked about, you know, well, what were your principles or how do you do that and, and certainly that um, mental well-being impact assessment toolkit starts to look at those from one level, although uh, because it's not campus-based it misses some of the specific policies and things that are particularly salient and relevant in a campus context. So, um, that sort of challenge in front of us. And then this, um, as Jenna put it, the, the further down the road aspect around, so you've now reviewed it, made some changes, uh, what does that actually look like for shifting um, and having that lever effect that we're, we're so hoping for uh, policy to have. I'm wondering, just to reframe my question, and again, out to everyone who's on the call, um, and again, building on, on Shailen's pieces, um, where, where do you feel you have the most momentum in the area of, of moving forward policy shift? Like, is it with your senior executive? Is it with your student body and, and like your AMS equivalent? Um, where do you feel that you, you're moving forward the fastest when it comes to policy? I'm, I'm wondering if anyone might want to weigh in on that question. And I'm hello. wondering, you know, knowing, oh, hello, go ahead. It's Suzanne Roseborough from Red Deer College in Alberta. Hi um, there. Hi. At very, very, very preliminary stages. Um, so just speaking from that experience, I mean, we're a long way from policy. But mm -hmm. uh, the whole concept uh, and Corey Key's presentation at the uh, post-secondary mental health summit in Calgary last June and, and the articulation of flourishing uh, of, of the concept of what it means um, and the, the really powerful um, depiction and realization that you could have no mental illness but if you lack mental wellness you could be as impaired or more as someone with severe mental illness. And so it strikes me, as always, when we're trying to make such momentous change, that, that it has to be about educating and informing. Um, and it can't be the flavor of the week. So I loved what the um, UBC student just said a few moments ago regarding making mental wellness a pillar, one of the pillars of the institution and one of the ways I see we could move forward um, and I'm sure it's the same in many of the post-secondaries new faculty have to go through training to learn how to train their to, to teach their expertise it could be embedded there right. uh, as, as a philosophical foundation for how the institution teaches but in order mm -hmm. to do that Existing faculty have to be um, have to understand and have to ch have to change in in relation to um, some of the the really profound findings like Martin Seligman's work, well-being before learning. Uh, it's critical to to every post-secondary institution. So to me, uh, Johnny, it is about it's about education and about talking this language in really uh, simple language that's concrete that makes it clear. So mm -hmm. one of the things we have on our on our bulletin board outside of our counseling center, we have a it's filled with the flourishing model and it's it's got you know eye catching things on it and and the and the caption is are you flourishing today? And it actually shows people things they could be doing as suggestions. It's there every day for people to see. And we're starting conversation with our senior leaders regarding what this could mean and that it has to be, in, as, as we're saying, embedded. Uh, it can't be an add-on. It can't just come from counseling. It can't just come from certain people. This has to translate into how we talk to each other, how we do our day-to-day -day jobs, and asking the question, not only are our students flourishing, but am I in my role in my institution supported to flourish? 
So that's where we are. Well, and Suzanne, I, I would, um, I would uh, say that uh, you are stepping much closer to that policy work in, in what you've just described and, and in, in the anchors that are um, you know, really supporting your thinking, well-being before learning. You know, and, and we've had many thought leaders in our community really reinforce that to get to the core mission of post-secondary, which is a big theme of our upcoming summit here in, in Vancouver in a few weeks, um, to get to the core mission of universities, which of course is education and the building of a citizenry, uh, well-being has to be at the forefront. And and you referencing Corey Key's work really does indicate um, how far along you are in your thinking at an institutional level. So thank you, Susan, for 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 that commentary. Um, anyone else want to add to 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 this where where you're feeling a bit of momentum? I think there was so much momentum in what was just shared. And anyone else want to weigh in? I heard a little beep there. Maybe someone is. This is Melissa from UBC Okanagan. Hello. Hi, Melissa. How um, are you? I, I'm well. How are you? <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, I think um, you know we're in a little bit further away from policy, uh, being that that's UBC wide when it's a policy discussion. So we're seeing that uh, should be UBC Vancouver and Okanagan. The policy is a little bit trickier for us to influence on our campus, but as far as practices and our ways of doing business, seeing tons of momentum in the students, and we're doing um, similar work with our uh, Student Senate Caucus and mentoring them in similar ways that Jenna, and they've helped us out uh, as well. Um, and then lots of engagement from faculty in new ways. Uh, 50 new uh, faculty engaged with us last term and um, just wanting to do the work within the classroom and really finding that as a, you know, it is that way of building momentum and, and culture shift can sometimes, um, you know, you hope you meet it from the top down as well, but that bottom up momentum can, um, I'm, I'm hoping it'll be creating a, a yeah, just the ability to make the change we need to. And to reflect back what I heard you say, Melissa, I think um, it's so interesting you being part of UBCO but being in the Okanagan, so subject to those same policies. And maybe, um, you know, in your own way, um, knowing all of the em embracing of well-being you've done at your institution further along in practice. And so there's a really great conversation that could happen between you and Jenna around um, bringing together those two bits of momentum, whether it's the policy framing and the practice framing. I mean, thinking of all the well-being and, and um, work that you've done at a very practical level at UBCO would be, would be, that would be a fascinating conversation to listen in on um, about uh, reconciling progress in those two areas. Thanks, Melissa. I'm just being mindful of time, and it's about 10 past 11 here in Pacific time land. And um, I'm just wondering if there's any final comments. I, I know BC, BCIT is on the line, and they're doing lots of thinking about this. I'm, I'm not sure if BCIT want to weigh in or, or a campus from outside of, of um, BC further afield. Hearing none, we'll move on to the final question, um, which um, Shailen's just going to pull up right now as we move into the final stretch. Um, do pop into the chat. I just want to do a quick pulse check. How is this webinar going for people? Are people um, learning? Are people enjoying it? Is it, is it filling you up? Um, feel free to pop any feedback into the chat box um, that might be helpful for us to understand as we keep moving forward. Let us know how this is going for you. So the last 10 minutes um, um, before I turn back to Ashley and Taya for next steps um, and how to stay connected to this work is, is, is where could we go from here? It, it, there's, there's an appetite building and there, there, of course it's being brought together through the COP for some collective action in this area. Um, you know, it's, it, it's clear that there's action happening on campuses um, at different stages of development, whether you're at Red Deer College or UBCO or BCIT or Camosun or wherever you are. You know, what could we do? Um, and I might go back to you, Suzanne, just for a second because you chimed in earlier. You know, what would be helpful for you as someone who's trying to move this work forward slowly at your campus? Like, what would you like? How, how could you see yourself recruiting support around your work from this broader community? Five people so far. How how could they help you? I would love to have a contact list uh, of those willing.
from this webinar and mm -hmm. with contact information and, and identification of where they're from. Um, I think the website itself will be a fabulous resource. Um, and I think being able to draw, like I, even in listening this morning, interesting to hear about some of the things that are happening in our neighbor institutions just up the highway, um, U, of, U of A and South U of C, around bringing flourishing into the transitional preparation that we do helping students trans moving into the work world. And that's really intriguing to me. And on a two, two, two other things I would love, I would love a national conference with Martin Seligman and Corey Keyes where we're talking very much about these concepts and their expertise on how to move it forward. I mean, Martin Seligman has done work with the U.S. Army. Um, I, I like to kind of believe it might be a bit easier in a, in a post-secondary. And so that that's, that's would be my idea. I would love to see this uh, and, and with a lot of influence from our um, Mental Health Commission. And again, that's really embedding it in Canadian society. That's mm -hmm. my thoughts off the top of my head. <laughs> that's great. Uh, that's excellent, Susan. And I, I, won't re I won't respond now just to kind of build up some momentum here. I, I know Douglas College is on the line with um, Aaron and Duane. Um, just to maybe give you a few seconds to catch yourselves and, and you know, is there anything that, that you think you could benefit from this, this national group around policy making at Douglas College? Any ideas from either of you? Star seven to unmute. Well, gee, Johnny, thanks for calling us out. <laughs> <laughs> Dwayne, I know I can do it with you, so um, uh, you're, you're very welcome. Go right ahead, Dwayne. Well, you, you know, at this point, uh, Douglas has a real appetite to explore this at all levels, um, and, and we're, we're moving forward, um, and we're really enjoying all of the resources and hearing from other people. That's very good. Thank you, Dwayne. That's, good. <laughs> That's all I've got. <laughs> That's great. That didn't land in the way I expected it. But I know, is, 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 the, is Carter on the line from Camosun? Are you here, um, Carter, Ombudsperson? Carter, are you with us? Good morning, Johnny. Yes, I am. Hi. It's because Shailen's got the list out, so I can see my name. Carter, you really grapple with policy every day as the Ombudsperson at a busy, busy urban college. You know, where is this conversation taking you this morning? Well, as you probably know, Johnny, um, under the guidance of Chris Balmer from Counseling, we have developed and just rolled out our mental health uh, strategy for students. Um, it was well received. We're complementing that with information sessions that uh, Chris Balmer has been le leading. And in addition, as a, um, an initiative from the Vice President of Education's office, after many years of not having a policy unit here, we had one for a while, but not for, the, for several years, and that caused any number of uh, issues. Uh, we now have a three-person group who are looking at policy issues, and I forwarded them the information on this morning's webinar, um, and I believe they may be on the line um, just wondering, Katie, if you're there. Yeah, I'm here. Good. Um, this is a, um, because it's such a new unit, we're looking at um, the integration of the strategy with policy initiatives. Uh, someone mentioned earlier that um, it's important to link um, the mental health strategy to um, the policy and the values of the institution. So we're, um, we've, we've done, there's been a lot of very good work done, Johnny, but we are still a little bit on the ground floor as it comes to integrating the policy piece with the uh, mental health strategy. That's great, Carter. I mean, and, and I just think, before I turn to one last comment with uh, Despina, Carter, what you just said was, was great. I mean, I think 
Um, you bringing your policy unit into this call is a really good example of leveraging local connectivity at your campus. And I think you know what our task is is broadening that. And I I, I want to to really respond to your ground floor comment because I think for many of us we can we can feel that we're behind the eight ball in doing this work. Um, but I mean we've been at this for a decade here in BC, and others have been at this longer. And um, really, we are light years ahead collectively at a national level than, than we've ever been. And, and, and that's through testament to all of the leadership that all of you have shown. And so actually, in many ways, as a collective, we're, we're at least on the third floor, not quite the ground floor. We've gotten in the elevator, and we're going up the building. And I, and I, I just really appreciate, Carter, you sharing more news about the release of your strategy. My last um I'm going to turn to Despina, who I, I think is from the Mental Health Commission of Canada, too, to see if you want to weigh in with, with a, a last comment before we, I turn things over to Ashley um, to close us out. But go ahead, Despina. So star seven to unmute Despina. Despina may be having technical difficulties or she may have had to step away. Um, if you want to chime in in the next few seconds, do go ahead or feel free to put, put your comment into the chat box. But maybe I'll just give it one more second, Despina, to see if you've unmuted yourself. Any final thoughts from the rest of the group before we turn I've got a final thought. Shailen, I think, has a final thought, she said. Um, but any final thoughts from, from the group based on your experience today? What are people leaving with, finally? Hello? Hello. Hi. Hi. This is Despina. Can everyone hear me? Hi, Despina. Go right ahead. Oh, my sincere apologies. I, I don't know what was going on with my phone. And uh, my apologies to, I believe, my, my colleague uh, had chatted briefly with you as well around our consensus conference. I'm from the Mental Health Commission, and part of my role was to be, and, and still as our project manager, for our initiatives that focus on the mental health of emerging adults. And as, as you spoke earlier to this, um, we hosted a consensus conference on the mental health of emerging adults and had uh, over 200 delegates. Uh, from across Canada, policymakers, individuals from education, youth justice, uh, child welfare, uh, et cetera. And the real goal of this conference was to help to develop a consensus statement with recommendations to help advance uh, recommendations, these recommendations and, and policies for services uh, and practices for EAs. Um, and so we're currently finalizing these recommendations with our jury panel and emerging adults who are on our jury panel as well as our um, other uh, advisory panel. Uh, we're hoping to release this in the spring. But one thing that we're hoping to do with these recommendations is to really build off of all of the work that you've all mentioned as well too. And in addition to developing a national advisory group to help kind of move forward these recommendations, we're looking also for your guidance uh, around how we can maybe tap into your networks or work with you to kind of move these pieces forward. So um, I just wanted to provide you with that update and let you know if you are interested or even if you're interested to learn more about what we're doing or to share your practices, please let me know and maybe we can make some really great connections there. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's great, Despina. And so definitely feel free to liaise with, with that caucus and us at CMHA and, and we, can, we can help um, make the linkages through that important work that you, you've moved forward since November. Um, Shailen, a final thought from you and then, and then we'll, um, I'll share one last observation. Yeah, I think um, one one thought that I had, which uh, relates back to one of the things that was shared um, earlier on in, in terms of where some campuses were at around uh, the notion of, and I think it was BIU uh, who was mentioning their their cross campus sort of multi stakeholder steering committee, and I know that that's an an aspect that a number of campuses have put in place or are looking to put in place, and it's certainly um, one of the, the key recommendations within the National Guide as a way to, to help move this work forward. And um, from my opportunity of being able to, to sit and, and participate and witness um, what goes on during some of those steering committees, um, a final thought I had is just 
it's also the power of the process. And so when you've got a chance to have uh, various different representatives sitting around a table having these conversations, um, they may very well be able to, within um, their everyday practice, if they're in a policy role or uh, a leadership role or as a faculty member in a department, be able to actually go back and, and influence um, shifts uh, within their realm and sphere of influence based on participating in that, that committee. And so um, just the notion that, that sometimes uh, the, the process can indeed be um, very powerful and, and be the product and, and can really spur along that change. So an invitation to folks who, who maybe are, are looking for ways to get started in this work overall and, and this particular area around policy, uh, just that opportunity of, of engagement and, and whether it be through a steering committee or as Rosie mentioned with their, um, their partnership with uh, the associate registrar, just the various different ways that we can think about uh, involving the actors who do have um, some level of control, if we will, or responsibility for the areas that we're looking to make a change. And um, so that's, that's my, my big final thought. My other one, just uh, knowing some of the other work that's happening would be um, to invite folks, um, if they uh, weren't able to participate in the Ontario webinar that took place last fall, um, that uh, visiting that link, you may be able to get a chance to uh, to catch up on information that was shared out from Confederation College and um, from Ryerson University, who, who both have been doing some work in this this policy area. Great, thank you, Shaylin. And um, there have been a few more chats just come through. I was I was hoping Durham Region Health Unit would weigh in and. Um, they've made a really strong recommendation for campuses to liaise with their local public health unit or authority for support. And in Ontario, that's a, a fairly large network, um, and a big part of their work is influencing policy. So people should should really look at their public health units. Um, and um, lots of kudos and thanks and and whatnot from folks. So thank you for that. And my final thought is is um, every time I help out with these webinars um, from the perspective of CMHA, which is a, a national federation. Um, and, and with National Scope, very similar to our partner Caucus in this work, um, I'm always struck at um, the momentum we have at a national level. And I know for a fact people are looking at the national momentum that we are collectively generating um, as a sign of some really positive change in, in moving forward the agenda of promoting the mental health of, 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 of the post-secondary population um, and also ensuring that they have healthier relationships with substances. So on behalf of CMHA, um, we are really thrilled to, to be a part of this and, and we look forward to supporting the continued conversation. This is the, um, I know I'm turning to, um, I'm turning to um, Ashley in a few seconds, but I do want to just pay kudos and thanks to Shailen because I may not get this opportunity. Shailen will be leaving us temporarily for a year to start a family. Um, in a few weeks, and she'll be with us for our summit in BC. But Shailen's been very instrumental in stewarding this work in partnership with Ashley and Tam. And I just want to publicly thank her and acknowledge all of the skill and diligence that she's brought to the two webinars that we've had to date. And Sarah Josie will be stepping into the uh, um, provincial coordinator role for Healthy Minds Healthy Campuses, and I'm sure will be playing a similar role in supporting these webinars moving forward. So a big, I just made a national announcement, <laughs> Shailen. Thank you, John. <laughs> Which was great. So um, thank you, Shailen, for, for all that you do. And Ashley, over to you. Can you can you hear me, Johnny? Yes, I can hear okay. you. Hello. Good. Yeah, I've lost my um, network connection, so I don't have access to the ReadyTalk platform. Um, so I just I can wrap up, and then I'll pass it over to Tayeb as well to to add his th final thoughts and comments about how we're going to be moving this work along and what's next for the community of practice. Um, so again, I just want to echo um, your thank you, Johnny, to Shaylin, and also to add a thank you to you, Johnny, for your support with the webinars that we've been offering as part of our community of practice. You've been an amazing resource to, to folks across the country and, and helping to move this work along at a national level. So we, we very much appreciate all the support that you've provided. Um, just some notes that I made as I was listening to the webinar about um, what our next steps can be. And, I think that it's really important that we continue the dialogue. And one of the things that we've started, for those of you who are on our, our COP mailing list, is a, an incubator group. So this is a group that's 
signed into the Healthy Minds Healthy Campuses platform in the community, on the online community, and it's um, it's looking at policy from a well-being lens. So in that group, we're we're hoping to share resources. So one of the first steps I noted is that we will copy all of the links that were posted in the chat box because there was lots of them, and make sure that we directly link people to those resources through our our online group on the Healthy Minds Healthy Campuses. So just to remind people, if you, if you want to join that site, just go to healthycampuses.ca, click on that community icon at the top, and then you can join our COP group after you've made a login. Um, it's National Campus Mental Health COP, and the, the Policy Wellbeing Lens is one of the groups, the National Incubator Group. So there's a bunch of members who have already signed up, so a great space to share ideas and share resources and look at potential next steps on how we can get involved. Um, so again, we'll be posting some resources and thinking about how we can move us forward. And so with that too, I think another key next step for a community is to look at some of these um, key learning topics at the Caucus 2016 conference. So I might actually get Ty up to talk a little bit about Caucus 2016 and what our COP is planning to do for that and ways that we can um, encourage involvement from everybody. And then we'll be ready to sign off. Thank you, Ashley. Uh, a big thanks to Johnny and uh, Shailen for such a, a wonderful and informative um, uh, webinar. And uh, I really enjoyed the discussion and, uh, and the resources uh, which were shared. Um, uh, folks who are interested in um, uh, forwarding this uh, dialogue, um, a, a big momentous place is going to be the next caucus. Uh, uh, in June in Winnipeg um, 2016 this year. Um, we have submitted um, a couple of proposals. Uh, some of them are directly linked to a national uh, campus uh, mental health. Uh, we are also planning uh, to uh, hold a social evening. So if you are interested, uh, please uh, uh, you can go to our uh, community of practice uh, on caucus web page and uh, join it uh, or email us if you have any questions uh, um, in terms of any activities that will be happening at caucus, uh, especially regarding to this COP. Um, and we are also, if you are uh, from other uh, mental health communities or other COPs of caucus, we'd love to hear from you and collaborate with you. So uh, you can uh, join our national COP list uh, and go to caucus website. Um, and hope uh, you can uh, make it to caucus 2016. Great. Anything more, Ashley? No, I think that's everything. I think we're right at 12:30 here, so that's all from my end as well. Great. Well, thanks everyone for joining us. Thanks, Ashley and Tayab, and we will see you on April 7th for our next webinar. Bye bye. Thank you, Johnny. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Have a great rest of your day. Thank <laughs> you.